Are you ready? Who did ever thought Cecil B. DeMille's would decide when the church started, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, welcome everybody. This is uh, Reformation Sunday here at 10th Street United Methodist Church. We are going to be privileged to have a visit from uh, Martin Luther, who sort of founded this particular Sunday many years ago. And uh, we welcome all of you here today to our, this uh, special service. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. And if you'll permit me, we're going to kind of compress the routine part of the service to give uh, Mr. Luther all the time he needs. Because uh, I recently uh, heard him again within the last week. And uh, I know what it takes and what he goes through to do it. And, we don't want to take away from that. Uh, are there, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, the first announcement is, of course, the church is going to participate downtown Thursday evening in Spooktacular. Uh, anybody who wants to come, please help us with the handing out of candy. We have a lot of candy. Uh, many of you were very generous with your donations and uh, just to make sure Susan and I are going to Costco tomorrow to make sure where there's going to be enough candy. There's enough money so we're going to have enough candy. Uh, the second item I would have for you to remember is uh, November the 5th. Not only is it election day and by the way early voting stops this coming Friday but November the 5th is election day but it also happens to be the night of the annual Kiwanis Club Pancake Supper. So if you need tickets, see Travis or I, and, or you could even buy them at the door if you change your mind at the last minute and what all. So that's always a fun event, and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. And then the next day, November the 6th, is the first of three Sunday, or Sundays, Wednesdays, when we'll have a Bible study. And... Uh, this year's Bible study is from Emma Adam Hamilton's book, Prepare the Way for the Lord. And uh, we have about eight or ten people already signed up. You don't have to be a member of this church, of course, to attend. We have folks coming from Thrall and First United Methodist here in town. So we always have a good time, and I think it will be very informative. Uh, any other announcements? Susan, you want to talk about uh, uh, Veterans Day? Veterans will be honored at the Moody Museum on Sunday, November the 10th. If you would like to bring a shadow box to honor any veterans that you've had in your family, um, we would be happy to put them on display. We're going to have a general from Fort Cavazos as our guest speaker that day. We're commemorating the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Okay, any other announcements? Uh, Ed and Betty have some guests with them and they were all here because of yesterday's very <laughs> successful car show. Uh, Ed, any announcement about that? There are 721 cars. Wow, 721 cars? My hearing isn't as bad as I thought it was. Very good. Any other announcements? Okay, if not, let us uh, all stand as we join in our call to worship. Bless be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, who destined us for who tested us for adoption as God's children through Jesus Christ, who has, who has forgiven, forgiven our sins according to the riches of God's grace, and has made his own to us the mystery of God's will. This is our God. Let us worship God together. And our opening hymn will be 368. Michael, you want to start us off? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. 
because I know from time to time it has been asked to me why we are pledging our loyalty to the quote Catholic Church that's Catholic with a little C and if you look at the explanation or definition of that it means universal not Roman Catholic there is a little bit of a difference okay uh, joys and concerns we have a few uh, the first one I would bring to your attention is uh, we would like to remember the uh, family and friends of uh, Marjorie Lynn Purcell. Uh, Lynn died last Sunday and her memorial service will be uh, next month, I think on the 27th of December. Uh, yeah, December, I'm sorry. I keep thinking we're already in November. Uh, are there any others among you that we need to remember or have uh, special prayers for uh, we need to remember uh, uh, Charles Sutton I understand he's now in hospice care Kenny is that right okay that's uh, Jamie's uh, brother uh, we always want to remember those that are in the nursing home or uh, special care and that includes Franklin uh, Bloomquist, uh, Lynette, Lynette, Lynette Tucker. I'm sorry? Lynette. Oh, Lynette Tucker, yes. Yes. And uh, Marie Conlon. Are there any others uh, specifically we, we, need, we need to remember today? Okay. Why don't we go to the Lord in private prayer? We will then do a pastoral prayer and follow that with the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray for a moment. <laughs> Almighty and gracious God, we come to you today thanking you for the blessings you've provided us, not only today, but those in the past. And we look forward to blessings in the future. We pray specifically today for the family and friends of Lynn House Purcell. And we pray also that you provide us with much needed rain and a change in weather in our area. We really need that your hand can provide. Be with all of us who uh, have gathered as friends and fellow uh, Christians. Be with those who have suffered in the past in the recent past through the hurricanes and the fires and the other catastrophes that have uh, happened upon our earth. We pray especially for peace in our time 
and look forward to the day when we can say all of our brothers and sisters enjoy the fruits of your benefit. We pray all of this in your name as we remember the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our next, oh, young disciples. Yes, and we have some. <laughs> We're not always blessed with young disciples in person. So I was thinking, oh, what am I going to say to attract the attention of those folks uh, who might be at home? But come on down, guys.
And as we're about to receive our offering today, let us stand and join in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, reading today comes from uh, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans uh, chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 and I really had to look closely because I couldn't find 16 but here it is when the day arrived according to my gospel God through Jesus Christ will judge the secret thoughts of all but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast of your relation to God and you and know his will and determine what is best will because of the instructions in the law. I think I think Martin Luther may be ready for us. Is he there? Good morning, my dear Mr. Okay. Because he is what good morning. Yes, we are very technical day and we are very good in good insight having Dick Bach. Dick Bach? Ah, forgive me, my friend. It is so natural for me to speak in my native language of Deutsch in German that I forget that today I must speak in English so that all present may understand. Find a look of confusion. Don't you recognize me? I am the reason you are all here today. Because of what God did through me more than 500 years ago. For not only you Methodists, but also the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, my own dear Lutherans, the Reformed churches, Oh, ja, I must confess, even the Baptist too. <laughs> I am Herr Dr. Martin Luther, professor of sacred scripture and pastor at the University of Wittenberg's Stadtkirche, by the grace of God, in our own beloved Germany in the province of Saxony. I welcome you here on this Lord's Day in which we remember the events leading up to the Protestant Reformation. I will be happy to share with you all that I can about those tumultuous days, so long as it is remembered that the credit for all that happened must go to God, or to God alone. I am but his humble instrument, a poor monk to whom the Almighty revealed the way of life that I might share it with others, God the dog. Looking back on those days, I must confess to still being quite amazed by all that happened. All I did was nail 95 theses, debate points, to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. And from that small event, a chain of events was loose that led to the Protestant Reformation. I was like the woodpecker pecking away at a great tree with all his might. When all of a sudden a great bolt of lightning came down from the heavens and struck the mighty tree, splitting it in two. The woodpecker got up, dusted off his feathers, looked at the great tree now lying in two halves on the ground, and said, my God, I didn't know I had it in me. <laughs> Well, I didn't have it in me, but God did. And by God's grace, he brought the truth of salvation to all the world, God's the dark. I, Martin Luther, 
was born on November the 10th, 1483, in the town of Eisleben, in the province of Saxony, in Germany, when I was baptized in St. Peter's Church there. I do not remember this myself, but I believe the testimony of my parents or to my fellow countrymen. I am the son of a peasant. My great-grandfather, grandfather, and father were all peasants. My father Hans was a miner, and I might have followed in his steps, <clears throat> going down every day into the mines to dig the precious coal out of the earth. But Hans was determined that his little Martin would do better in life. And so he saved, and scrimped, and managed to gather enough money to enroll me in the university at Erfurt to study to become a lawyer. Then Hans reasoned, I might care for him and my mother in their old age. I studied hard, and earned my bachelor's or master's degree from the university at Erfurt. But I was not destined to complete my studies in law school. God, in God's wisdom, had other plans for me. You see, I grew up as a good son of the Roman Catholic Church. I believed all that I was taught by the parish priest. Now the church in our day had long since forgotten the teachings of scripture, that God is a loving God who longs to welcome us into his heavenly home. <clears throat> a lot of superstition had gotten mixed in with our religion in those days. We were taught that God was a harsh and condemning judge who delighted in sending sinners to an eternal hell. We were told that we had to earn our salvation, that we had to do enough good deeds to persuade God to allow us into heaven. It was believed that the surest way to do this was to become a monk or a nun, that they had a better chance of getting into heaven than anyone else. Uh, this was the religion I was brought up with. This was what I was taught. <coughs> this was what I believed. God was not someone to be loved, but someone to be feared. Ours was also a culture haunted by death. In 1347, the Black Plague swept across Europe, wiping out whole villages and half of city populations. In the early 13th century, the devil's own horsemen, the Mongols, led by Genghis Khan, overran the land all the way from the steppes of China to the gates of Prague as unstoppable as a plague of locusts. Then came the Muslims. In the Middle Ages, they overran and captured Jerusalem. They took all of North Africa. They even made inroads into southern France and into Spain. <coughs> In 1453, Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks. Indeed, these things weighed heavily upon us. And there were some who whispered that the end of the world was near. Several of my brothers and sisters died of the plague while I was growing up. And one of my best friends, a teacher at the university, was murdered by a disgruntled student with an axe. His death terrified me. What if it had been me? Would I have gone to heaven or to hell? I did not know. And so it was that on a sultry afternoon in July of 1505, I was walking along a road outside the village of Stottenheim. I had been home to Eisleben to visit my parents over the weekend, or now I was returning to the University at Erfurt. Suddenly the sky became overcast. Great rolls of thunder rumbled across the sky. Bolts of lightning flashed in the heavens. The rain began to come down in torrents. I looked desperately for shelter, but there was none to be found. 
when suddenly a great bolt of lightning struck the ground not five yards from where I stood. The force of the blast knocked me to the ground. My clothing was singed by the heat. I struggled to rise as the rain kept pummeling down upon me. I was certain that the mouth of hell was opening beneath me to swallow me whole. In terror, I cried out to Satan, the patron saint of minors, Help me, Satan! I will become a monk. The storm passed over. I was still alive, a little singed around the edges, but otherwise no verse for there. And so I decided I had made a promise that I must keep. The next morning I left law school and entered the Augustinian monastery in Erfurt. And I was indeed a good monk and kept the rule of my order so faithfully that I may truthfully say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, I should have been that man. <laughs> All my brothers and sisters in the monastery who knew me will testify to this. I might have become a martyr through good deeds, through prayer and fasting and study, had I remained a monk much longer. <coughs> I would fast for days at a time. I would go to confession and confess for hours at a time, every little sin I could think of. I would confess so many hours that my confessor, bless his heart, would fall asleep on the other side of the confessional booth. I would recite countless psalms. I would sing countless hymns. In the dead of a winter's night, I would throw off the single blanket I was allowed and lie shivering on my cot. I would perform all sorts of menial chores around the monastery. In the dead of winter, I would stand naked in an icy stream trying to mortify my flesh in order to save my soul, which was a big surprise and shock to the fish, let me tell you. <laughs> but I discovered that no matter how much I did, no matter how much I fasted, no matter how much I prayed, no matter how much I studied and denied myself, I had no sense of peace with God. No feeling that God accepted me. God remained a source of terror to me. When I was certain that he evaded the first opportunity to condemn me to the flames of hell. <clears throat> no, Dr. Johann von Staupitz was the leader of our Augustinian order of monks. When Dr. Staupitz could see how disturbed I was. Dr. Staupitz was one of the few leaders in the church of that day who remembered the teachings of Scripture. I will confess here and now that had it not been for dear Dr. Staupitz, I might have sunk into the miry bog never to rise again. One day he said to me, Martin, Martin, has no one ever told you that Christ died for our sins? He could tell I didn't know what he was talking about. And so Dr. Staupitz informed me that he had decided <coughs> that I should return to the University at Erfurt to earn my doctorate in theology. I protested, but Dr. Staupitz, so much work will kill me. He said, we all have to go sometime, Mark, and you might as well be doing something worthwhile than you do. So I returned to the university and earned my doctorate in theology. Well, then Dr. Staupitz informed me that he was assigning me to teach Bible classes to students at the, at the University of Wittenberg. Now this was the wisest thing Dr. Staupitz could have done for requiring me to go back and earn my doctorate in theology and then assigning me to teach Bible to other students forced me to get back to the scripture, back to the basics of our faith. And it was as I immersed myself in the study of the sacred scripture that I made the greatest discovery of my life, 
the discovery that led to the Protestant Reformation. For the first time in my life, I began to study the scripture systematically. I began to see as I prepared my lectures for my students that the Bible is a living book. It has a voice and it speaks to me. It has feet and they chase me. It has hands and they grasp me. And so it was that on a cold October evening in 1516, I was working in the tower of, my, of the Augustinian monastery in my study, translating the scripture from German, from, from Latin into German so that my students might more easily understand it. As I worked by the light of my flickering candle, I chanced upon a verse I had never noticed before. I was preparing a series of lectures for my students on St. Paul's epistle to the Romans. And while doing so, my eyes fell upon Romans, the first chapter, verse 17. For the apostle writes, The just shall live by faith. What is this? I asked myself. Here was no saying, no mention by the blessed apostle about God being a harsh condemning judge. St. Paul has nothing to say about God requiring us to do enough good works to earn our salvation. All that St. Paul says is necessary for us to receive salvation is to have faith in Christ. Then it hit me. God in him in. How could I have been so blind as to have ignored this great and simple truth for so long? God is not a harsh condemning judge. God is a loving father who longs to welcome us into his heavenly family. Salvation is not something we have to earn. Salvation is a free gift given to us by God that we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Sola fide, faith alone is necessary for our salvation. Thereupon I felt myself to have been reborn or entered into paradise. These words from the blessed apostle Paul became for me the gateway to heaven. The next morning I shared my newfound discovery with my students. And they too believed and found peace in their souls. Something new began to happen as I taught at the University of Wittenberg and preached each Sunday at the Stadtkirche, the town and parish church of St. Mary's in Wittenberg. I might have lived out my life in obscurity as a college professor and parish priest had it not been for a man named Tetzel and the selling of something that is called an indulgence. In those days, you see, an indulgence was a piece of paper signed by the Pope which stated that because of a certain amount of money an individual had given to the church, that that individual was granted forgiveness of their sins. It's a pretty good fundraiser when you think about it. But, uh, we know that is all a bunch of nonsense. We are saved by faith alone. But the common people did not know that. Most of them could not even read. When they believed all that they were taught by the leaders of the church. And so Saint Pope Leo X was trying to build St. Peter's Basilica. A great beautiful church in Rome. And to raise money for the building of St. Peter's, Pope Leo decided to issue a special indulgence, stating that everyone who contributed money to the building of St. Peter's Basilica would be com granted complete forgiveness of every sin they would ever commit or automatic, automatic acceptance into heaven. Oh, Hilfin lieber Gott. I still shudder to think about it. What a blasphemy. 
For Pope Leo sent his indulgence peddlers all through Europe. On one of them, a man named Tetzel, a Dominican monk, came to Wittenberg. On Tetzel put on quite a show. He would describe in lurid detail the horrors of hell, the scalding flames, the sulfurous fumes, the moans of the eternally lost souls. And then he would tell the crowd that had gathered, for just a few dollars you can buy this indulgence signed by the Pope, which guarantees that you will never have to go to this horrible place. Oh, and do you have loved ones who have already died? No worries, my friends. Indulgences are retroactive. You can buy one for your departed loved ones, too. Or then Tetzel would sing a little jingle. Step up to the money box and drop in your coin. For as soon as the coin in the money box doth ring, the soul from hell doth spring. When people bought those indulgences like they were going out of style, when many of my parishioners bought them and trusted in those miserable scraps of paper for their salvation instead of in Jesus Christ. One Sunday morning I was walking down the street to the Stadt Kirke to preach when I saw one of my parishioners, a farmer named Schultz, lying stone cold drunk in the gutter by the side of the road. I kicked him awake when I said, Schultz! What is the meaning of this? You are baptized. You are a Christian. You cannot live this way. Think about your poor wife, Greta, or your dear children, Hans and Freta. He looked up at me through bleary eyes when he waved one of those indulgences he had brought from Tetzel in my face. When he said, no matter no more how much I sin, Brother Martin, <laughs> See, it says so right here. It's signed by the Pope himself. Well, that was too much. That morning, instead of what I had originally planned to preach, I preached against indulgences. On that evening, I wrote out my 95 theses in which I argued that salvation is not something that can be bought or sold it is not something that can be sold by a, on a scrap of paper signed by the Pope or anyone else. Salvation is a free gift given by God when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. And on All Hallows' Eve, October the 31st, 1517, I nailed my 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg as a public statement of the stand I was taking. Now, I had intended the theses to merely be a summons to debate among the university faculty. Colleges are always debating one thing or another, and I was merely stating that there were 95 points of disagreement I had with the leaders of the church based on scripture when I invited my colleagues on the faculty to join me to debate whether or not the church was wrong based on scripture on these 95 points. But some of my students, without my knowing it, got copies of the theses. They had them translated into every language in Europe. They had hundreds of copies printed up on the printing press, which had been invented by Johann Gutenberg in the previous century and had them sent throughout Europe. A lot of people read what I had to say. And a lot of people liked the things that I said. The sale of indulgences began to fall off. This made Pope Leo very angry with me and my followers, whom he began to call Lutherans. Over the next few years, I had numerous debates with followers of the Pope defending my cause. Finally, Pope Leo decided it was time to silence me. He had me and my followers summoned to the Diet or Council of the Holy Roman Empire, which met at Worms, Germany, on, a, on April the 18th, 1521. <coughs> there I stood, 
before the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V himself and the gathered leaders of church and state. And Charles V gave me a choice. I could either recant, take back everything I had taught about salvation through faith alone, cease preaching against indulgences, would accept the authority of the Pope without question, or I would be condemned as an outlaw by the leaders in both church and state. <clears throat> then I could tell they meant business. I knew they would do what they threatened. I would be condemned as an outlaw and heretic by the church and the state. But God's truth is God's truth. I could never go back on the truth God had revealed to me in my tower study that evening. I knew what I had to do. So I squared my shoulders and looked the emperor straight in the eye and said, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils for they have contradicted one another. My conscience is captive to the word of God, and to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot and will not recant anything. God help me, I cannot do otherwise. Amen. Then I threw up my hands in the gesture of a victorious knight and walked from the room. I survived the condemnation of the Pope and the Emperor because I was protected by our Prince in Saxony, Frederick the Elector, who has also become a follower of the truth of the Gospel. And since that day, the Reformation has spread across Europe. Over the next few decades, my life was a bustle of work. In 1534, we produced my translation of the Bible into German. Find the translation was so good, if I may say so myself, that Moses seemed more German than Jewish. <laughs> I wrote three treatises, and my greatest book, The Bondage of the Vid. In 1527, while struggling with a bout of depression, I took the words of an old German beer drinking tool paraphrased the words of Psalm 46, when produced to him a mighty fortress is our God. Once, the, as the Reformation continued to spread, one of my students told me a story about a priest who was conducting a graveside service in a neighboring province. A stray dog approached and relieved itself in the bottle of holy water. <laughs> The poor father shouted, you impious dog, are you a Lutheran too? <laughs> At the age of 41 years, I took a wife. It happened in the most unusual way. Twelve ladies who were in the convent contacted me requesting help in leaving the convent and entering the Reformation. Well, I was friends with a fishmonger who delivered pickled herring and other fish to the convent every week. I told him that the twelve nuns wanted to join us in Wittenberg in the Reformation. And so the fishmonger smuggled the twelve ladies out of the convent in empty pickled herring barrels. They arrived at Wittenberg, safe and sound, not smelling too good, but otherwise fine. I found husbands for eight of the ladies. Three of them returned home to their parents. But for the twelfth lady, I came up empty-handed time and time again. She would not have any man I found for her. She was 26 years old, red of hair, when called Catherine von Bora. My father Hans told me I should bed her myself and give him grandchildren as a heritage. I began to think about it as a good way to give public testimony to the freedom that scripture gives priests or nuns to marry. And also it seemed a good way further to spite the Pope. 
And so I told Katie that while I did not love her, I could certainly learn to do so in Christ, and that if she would have me, I would marry her in order to spite the Pope, to kick the devil, and to please my father. And so we went. And I did indeed come to love Katie over the years. Life greatly changes for a man when he wakes up in the morning to find a couple of pigtails on his pillow that had not been there before. Ours was a happy household. Prince Frederick the Elector gave us the old Augustinian monastery in Wittenberg to live in. Every man should marry a nun, my friends. They are good cooks and they know how to take care of you when you are ill. God blessed us with six children over the years. Our firstborn was a son named Hans. As the little one was wrapped in his swaddling clothes, he began to cry. When I said, kick little fellow, that's what the Pope tried to do to me, but I got loose. Our household bustled with children, with students whom we were boarding, with the singing of hymns, with the pl my lute play, with my table talk. Ah, my friends, it is a foretaste of heaven to rock a cradle with one hand while preparing a sermon with the other. Christmas, when the snow lay fight upon the ground, was my favorite time of year. One Christmas Eve, while leaving, after leaving a Christmas Eve service, I spotted a beautiful evergreen tree covered in icicles, glittering in the moonlight. It was so beautiful that I chopped it down and dragged it home when Katie, the children, and I set it up by the fireplace and decorated it with candles. Looking back, that was the first Christmas tree. Our Yule custom Germans have taken with them forever they have traveled in the world. I also wrote my children a carol lullaby, a vey in a manger. Yeah, but, but there were troubles too. In my later life, my daughter Magdalena died of an illness at the age of 14. As I held her in my arms, I said, Dear Lady, you would like to stay here with your heaven earthly father, I know, but, but you are not afraid to go and be with your heavenly father, ya? Yeah? She said, Yes, Papa. Whatever God wills. She died in my arms. Katie sobbed quietly in a corner. I must tell you I could not find it in my heart to give God thanks. At Magdalena's graveside I said, Dear child, you will rise and shine like the stars and the moon and the sun. How strange it is to know that she is in heaven with God at peace and all is vain. And yet to still feel this sadness or emptiness in my heart. <clears throat> At the age of 62, while traveling with my three sons, Hans and Paul and Martin, to settle a dispute <coughs> among Christians, I became deathly ill in Eisleben, the town of my birth. Severe chest pains and other miseries beset me. At 2 a.m. on the morning of February the 18th, 1546, I spoke my last words. We are beggars, it is true. But then I died safe in the arms of Jesus. I am buried beneath the pulpit of the castle church in Wittenberg and in Worms, Germany, for I stood firm for the gospel before the emperor. There stands a statue of me. The statue is holding a Bible in one hand and pointing to the Bible with the other hand. On the caption on the statue reads, If it is God's work, it will endure. If it is man's work, it will perish. The Reformation is an ongoing work, my friends. Always there is a need for folks to be reminded of the truth that we are saved by grace alone through faith in Christ. When this I did in my time, so you may do in yours. 
You may share that blessed faith in Christ with your friends or neighbors or family. The spirit of the Reformation may live on in your hearts and in your communities. What better way to live our lives than in service of our Lord Jesus Christ? Praise be to God. Amen. But now we are going to sing a closing hymn, number 453, More Love to Thee, O Christ. Let's all stand together and sing 453, More Love to Thee, O Christ. of God and the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace and stay safe.